Hey gang, LinkedIn is number one in B2B display advertising in the U.S. And using LinkedIn advertising gives you a great advantage. You can stand out against your competitors while nurturing customer relationships and growing your brand. LinkedIn's targeting tools allow you to reach your precise audience down to their job title, company name, location, and more. That means your ads are being seen by those who matter. Scale your marketing, grow your business with LinkedIn advertising. As a thank you to their customers for helping them grow three times faster than the competition and just for listening to Winfluence, LinkedIn is offering a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash Winfluence. That's right. LinkedIn.com slash Winfluence just for you to claim that credit. LinkedIn.com slash Winfluence. A hundred bucks in free ads? I'm down. On this episode of Winfluence. Molly, let me start with you on this one. Are are the influencer marketing software platforms good? Are they bad? Are they useful to you? Are they not so? Uh, Don't ask is- the talent manager this question. <laughs> well, no, Especially I'm asking the talent manager. Podcast. I told you I was going to piss you off. Here we go. I think our answers might piss more people off than maybe you posing that question. I was going to well, say. You can blame it on me, but I, I want you to answer the question. There's a difference between being an influencer and actually influencing. I'm Jason Fall. And in this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate that difference. Welcome to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. As you know, here on Winfluence, we spend a good deal of time talking to influencers and content creators. We also have had the chance to dive into the talent management side of the industry and see the space from the angle of someone who is mindful of the creator's business and the brand's needs in interacting with them. Today on Winfluence, we have an interesting and rare treat. Molly Tracy is a talent manager who came from the brand and agency side of things, only to go out on her own and start Bray Digital, her own talent management firm. Jess Keys is a popular lifestyle blogger and influencer. She's at Jess Keys underscore on Instagram. She's also one of Molly Tracy's clients. I rolled the dice and asked them both to come on the show together. I wanted to talk to the talent and the talent manager about that relationship, how they collaborate to serve brands and Jess's audience in authentic ways, what the challenges of being talent in today's volatile marketplace are, and more. We had such a fun discussion, I kept pushing a little deeper and even got both of them to answer a hot-button question. What did they think of the influencer marketing software companies and managed services? Those are set up to serve the brands, but are they set up to serve the creators? You might be surprised at their answers. Let's just say the software company folks might want to get out some notepads and pens to take some notes today. You might also want to bring along some ice packs and band-aids. This one's going to sting a little. An honest and revealing discussion about being the talent and being the talent manager and working with each is coming up. But first, I have to give a big shout out and thank you to Storyblock. It's a headless content management system and a new sponsor and supporter of this program through the Marketing Podcast Network. Folks, you've got to download the Storyblock State of Content Management Report. It's a very useful survey of 515 businesses in the U.S. and Europe, companies just like yours and how they are approaching content distribution through their digital channels in 2022. I promise you'll get some interesting insights and inspiration for your content management plans. That's the State of Content Management Report from Storyblock. Just go to storyblock.com slash Winfluence for your free report. That's Storyblock without the C, S-T-O-R-Y-B-L-O-K dot com slash Winfluence. Go get the report. It's free and it's really handy might even inspire you to improve how you manage all that content you need to. Storyblock.com slash Winfluence. A talent manager and her talent. How they work, how they collaborate, and how they feel about influencer marketing software companies. Molly Tracy and Jess Keys are next on Winfluence. Hey gang, I've got something really cool for you. Time and place is everything, especially in marketing. But in today's age of a million messages per minute, not enough hours in a day, how do you really get your target audience's attention? Well, 
I do it with LinkedIn advertising. They have targeting tools that allow me to reach my precise audience down to their job title, company name, location, and more. That means my ads are being seen by those who matter. Yours can too. LinkedIn advertising helps you speak to the right people at the right time. Stand out against your competitors while nurturing customer relationships and growing your brand. Scale your marketing and grow your business with LinkedIn advertising. LinkedIn is offering a $100 credit on your next campaign just for listening to the Marketing Podcast Network. Go to linkedin.com slash mpn to claim that credit. That's linkedin.com slash mpn. All right, so Molly, you're the talent manager, and Jess, you're the talent in that equation. How did you guys meet? Who wants to take that one? Jess and I actually met before I started my own agency. I was working for an agency here in Chicago and started the talent management leg of the business there. And Jess was one of our very first signees. And then when I left to start my own agency, Bray, in 2019, she was my first signee there as well. So she's an OG, and we've been together for... I don't probably five years, probably now, years I guess. now. Yeah. Five yeah. yeah, about five or six years been together. <laughs> time time flies when you're having fun. It really does. True. Well, you, and you survived the pandemic together too, which is I mean, I guess that's not as hard when you work primarily virtually, but at the same time. If you've been together five years, you've you've been through some some wars here, haven't you? Yeah. We have and lots of like fun life changes. Jess has had a baby yeah. almost a year ago now. I can't believe it. it. Yeah. Wow. That feels like yesterday, but yeah, Molly was the reason I could stay sane. Um, when I had a newborn baby <laughs> and was trying to figure out how to juggle work, um, and new motherhood. So I, I really do not know what I would do without you truly. But I'm going to, I'm going to get more deeply into that. So you can, you can go into details on all that in a second, because I instead of doing the traditional, you know, route, for a Q and a on this, I want to jumble it all up. I want to know what a talent manager does for their talent, but I don't want Molly to answer. <laughs> Jess, what does a talent manager do for you as a creator? How, how does she enhance your work? She basically takes all of the stuff that is not content creation off of my plate so I can just focus on content creation and doing what I do best. And she takes on all of the things that I am horrific at, um, like answering emails, for example, or reading and signing contracts or, um, you know, negotiating my own rates or knowing what I'm even supposed to be charging for something. Um, that's a big part of her job, you know, just kind of champ championing me and, um, you know, pushing me and knowing what I I'm worth and, you know, being a cheerleader when I need her to be and reining me in when I need her to rein me in. <laughs> so yeah, in a nutshell, that's, that's kind of what she does. I'm blushing over here. You know, my goal as a manager is like just said, is to take things off their plate so they can really focus on what they love to do. So that's everything from like, strategic business planning and like, what does this year look like? And what does next quarter look like just down to like admin support and also part-time therapist? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I am like a type Z person. She's like my type A person. <laughs> <laughs> she, are, she is all the characteristics I do not have that I need. <laughs> so it's a little bit like a marriage. You kind of have to balance each other out a bit. Yes. A hundred percent. Sometimes yeah. I feel like I talk to Jess more than I talk to my own boyfriend. So <laughs> very nice. Our text threads are longer. <laughs> All right. Let, let me flip it then. Molly, what does what does the talent do? It can be Jess specifically, but it could also be any of the other talent you work with. What does your talent do that makes your role and their role more effective? I would think that number one is Jess won't say this, but my talent is incredibly timely with responses which is really helpful as like you're negotiating deals. Some of them move very quickly. You know, the brand is looking to hear back from you within, you know, 36 to 72 hours. And so any timely response that I can get from my talent is really nice just to keep the deal flow moving. Being timely with deadlines is amazing. You know, we really like to be able to like manage expectations on our side and make sure that we're turning things in when they're due, but then also just making sure that all of our, you know, I's are dotted and T's are crossed. We have all the right handles and hashtags in there. You've nailed all the key messaging. You've gotten the visual guidelines down. So really sort of being buttoned up in the way that we present content. And also like what my talent is so amazing at is added value. 
I think added value really goes far with brands. And so trying to make sure that we're doing something on the front end that feels very organic and sharing a product as we're testing and learning before a partnership goes live. My creators and Jess especially are so great about that. And I think it really helps just like build a little bit of affinity with the brand and with their audience. It feels so much more authentic and organic when you do that. Definitely agree with that. So, so Jess, let's dive in a little bit to your uh, brand and the evolution of building that. When did you know you needed someone to represent you? Because I know that's an unfamiliar thing when you're going through it. So when did you know you needed somebody like Molly to help you with stuff? So before Molly came along, I really didn't think that I was in a place to have management because I think at that point, you know, a few years ago, it was really just like the huge, massive influencers who had representation. And I was not, I hadn't heard, you know, I had friends who were represented by these big agencies and I, I had heard mixed things and I was, I just didn't think that was ever going to be a fit for me. I wasn't at the place in terms of following where like they would have even been interested, I don't think. But Molly reached out to me when she was at her agency and they were opening this new sector, I guess. And they were focusing more on local creators, but they, I think for the first time it was, there was a talent management opportunity for mid-sized creators or, you know, however we're defining people with, I don't even know how many followers I had at the time on Instagram, 50 to 60, maybe. I'm not sure. And so she reached out, she spearheaded this entire thing by herself. And through the course of us working together, (laughs) I was just like, why are you doing, why are you working for someone else? Go out on your own, do this full time. Like you have no idea. I also have an agency background. So I knew how much work was going into this. And yeah, but long story short, it was the solution that I I didn't know that I needed, like, I I certainly had all these pain points that I was looking for help with, but I didn't know the solution was out there. And so um, being able to have her come on board um, and just help me with the management side of things. And also, you know, the strategic part of things, I can text her when I have a, when I'm like, does this make sense to you? Does this make sense for my brand? Or how do you think I should bring this to life? And she can brainstorm with me. And she's just like the partner that I never knew was out there. (laughs) So that. That's been a big, a big part of my career is, is Molly. So Molly, again, I'll a feel good over. podcast for me, you guys. It, there you go. <laughs> we're, we're, well, don't worry. I'm going to make everybody mad in a minute. That's, that's a trademark <laughs> of mine. So Molly, let's flip that a little bit. Is there a, something that you look for in new talent to recruit, you know, a, a new creator on your roster? Or I guess, are there things that maybe indicate to you that a content creator maybe isn't necessarily ready or a good fit for representation when you're looking out there and and maybe scouting for new talent? How do you know I need to reach out to this person versus, man, they're not ready? Yeah. And I think that that's evolved a lot as my business has grown too. I am at a place at my agency now where I'm really looking to bring on creators who are doing this full time. So you should be, I think anybody that's looking to bring on management and is open to giving up a percentage of their income should be able to do that and support themselves in a financial space. So you should definitely be doing this full time. You should be actively having inbound opportunities coming to you that are supporting your bottom line and your business right now. Again, if you're going to give up a percentage there, it needs to make sense for you. I look for creators personally that have a source of income that doesn't live on a borrowed space. So everybody that I work with actually has their own blog still, or they have their own app, they're podcasting, they have a newsletter. It's really, really important to me that you have a space that is your own. I think you know everyone lives in the fear that TikTok or Instagram or YouTube could be gone tomorrow. And then what are you left with? Your career sort of can't go out the door with that. So very important that you have an own space that is your own. I really just want to work with nice people. <laughs> That's my number one criteria is that I only work with female founder or female creators. I want them to be nice humans since I work so closely with my talent and I keep a very tight roster. I really consider these women like my family and some of my best friends. And so do you gel with me personally? And can I see myself like having a glass of wine with you or inviting you over my house for dinner? If I can't, you're probably not a fit for my roster. So it's less, you know, I have some creators that are in the 48,000 or 48,000 follower range to 300,000 follower range. So it isn't necessarily a follower count that I'm looking for. I'm really looking to see, you know, do you have an engaged community? Do I love like what your mission and purpose is? And do I love how you are engaging with your community? And are you a nice human being? If you are, we're probably a good fit. I was also going to add, knowing your roster, and uh, I mean, full disclosure, I'm personally friends with some of them. 
I would say you're very choosy and choosing to work with very authentic influencers. So people who are putting themselves out there on a daily basis who you feel like, you know, who genuinely really care about their audience and aren't just trying to push product that I think is kind of a differentiating factor between you and other talent management agencies out there is you're very choosy about that. Yeah. Everyone I work with are real humans, right? And they're vulnerable about the spaces in their life that they're vulnerable about. So yeah, I try to choose creators that I think have a really authentic point of view and a center of like realness about them. So as a follow on to that, Molly, is there a, what's the limit? How many people can one person manage before you have to bring on somebody else to help you manage more people? Um, Jason, that is the question of the hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I also um, asked myself this question, Jason. <laughs> there's definitely was a time in my life that I had. So right now I have nine women that I work with, nine really amazing women. Um, there was a time in my life where I was managing you know, upwards of between 18 and 20, which is much, much too much for one person to handle. I really feel like my sweet spot is somewhere around 10 is probably my max. I'm also somebody that likes to work with people in a a specific niche. So I don't necessarily have a roster full of all food bloggers. To me, that isn't exciting. Everyone that I work with sort of has their own content verticals. I've always said like my biggest nightmare as a manager would to have like a roster of like 15 white influencers like that lifestyle influencers that I have to send to a brand to be like, Oh, here, like take your pick. They're basically all the same, you know, like it doesn't do anything for me or my soul to have people that are doing the same thing. It's really important to me that I have some diversity on my roster and diversity in content categories as well. I also think it helps with a little bit more of like targeted pitching too. If I'm reaching out to an athletic wear brand, I want to send like my soul fitness creator that I know is going to knock it out of the park for that brand versus like, hey, here's the 10 fitness creators that I'm working with. Like, who's interesting to you? I just don't find that to be very effective in terms of actually being able to secure partnerships and peak brand interest. Well, I would, I would also think it's a little hard for you to adequately represent each one of them if they're all the same, right? I mean, you, you're you going to go with the ones that the brands gravitate to versus making sure that you're advocating for all of them equally. I would think that would be a challenge. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's definitely management companies out there that have specialties and it and it works for them. I've just found that this style of pitching and honestly, I just I really appreciate working with women in different content verticals. It's exciting for me to do a food partnership one day and a motherhood one the next day and then fitness the one after that. So, it keeps my job nice. interesting. So, Jess, one of the reasons uh Molly recommended that I talk to you is because I asked her if she knew any creators out there that are really exceptional at measuring and quantifying Find the ROI or the value behind what they're doing for their brand partners. So she said you were it. Uh, so, and, and, you, and you mentioned earlier that, you know, you have an agency background, so that makes a lot of sense to me. Tell me a little bit about your approach to driving that value first and then quantifying it for folks. Well, I think first and foremost, I don't accept partnerships with brands that I am not 100% obsessed with. Typically, these are brands that I already am spending my own money on, or I am more than happy to shell out my own money on in the future or during a partnership especially if that's something where I'm getting a lot of gifted items, I still like to make sure I'm going out of my own way to spend my own money because that just doesn't seem authentic to me, um, both from my reader's standpoint and also just from a, as a consumer of a brand. If I'm really going to be a huge fan of a brand, I, wouldn't I be spending my own money? So I think that is a huge <laughs> determining factor in that my audience now knows because I tell them and they can see when, whenever they are looking at my content that I'm not going to promote a brand if I don't trust them, if I'm not obsessed with them. So I don't usually get the, you know, the DMs that are like, do you actually like this product? And if I do, it's somebody new and they, they just aren't that used to my content yet. So again, that I think that's like a twofold. That's really important from an, a reader standpoint. It's important from a brand standpoint. Second, I think just showing that, you know, maybe this brand is paying me for one or two Instagram posts or blog posts, but also I'm making sure that my audience knows that I'm still using this brand in my everyday life. And I'm still using this, this product every day. And they may have been a sponsor previously, but they're not paying me to post this particular story or etc. And as you know, anyone with an advertising background knows that somebody needs to be exposed to a product seven to 10 to 14 times in order to actually 
convert and buy it. So that's something that I try to do constantly as well. Jess always takes a really thoughtful approach to making sure that we can deliver on ROI. And this is really something that Jess and I work on together to make sure that like A, we're pricing a partnership appropriately based off of a brand's KPIs. So, you know, if they're telling us like, hey, we're looking for, you know, a 0.7 return on this, like Jess and I can then brainstorm, okay, what does the scope of work need to look like and back end into what that budget should be in order for us to hit that goal. Jess is just like incredibly business savvy in the way that we structure our partnerships. And we are very much like long game people. I mean, Jess, you've been doing this for how long now? Almost eight eight years, eight years. Yeah. Yes. And so she's somebody that understands the long game of this industry, right? Like we are not a team that is looking for a one-off partnership. Like we are really looking to build long-term relationships with our partners. And so pricing ourselves in a way that exceeds ROI expectations sets us up for a secondary partnership or a year long partnership. So I think like for us, both coming from the brand side and having worked on that side of the business before we are really able to kind of like speak that language to brands and have an understanding of like, okay, what are your KPIs for this? You know, if it's a brand awareness play, then I think that this is the right scope of work to go with. You know, if you're looking for conversion, then let's probably not do an in-feed post and focus on stories and blog instead. So it's, we, you know, being able to speak that language as I think has really set us up for success to not only like knock it out of the park with our partnerships, but also secure really amazing long-term brand partners. And I think it's being willing to test different things out. So if a brand comes to us and they say, you know, we're looking for conversions are our number one goal, but we want to in feed posts, Molly and I are going to, are going to say, well, actually, no, that's not the right thing. We need to do stories. Even, even if it's means less money for us upfront, if I'm confident in a product, I'm confident in a brand, I can say, okay, let's test out stories first and see if that gets us to where you want us to be. And then we can kind of tweak things from there. I think it's, it's important to kind of know where, know what I'm good at. And okay, if you want awareness, let's do this. If you want conversion, let's do this and kind of customize something based on what a brand is looking for. Jess and I are both sort of like a little bit of data nerds in that sense of like, we have the case studies to back it up because like we're so ingrained in her insights and analytics, whether that's just, you know, what's built out socially of being able to see click throughs and things like that, but then also looking at her affiliate networks. And so that's something I use in my own pitching. I'm hyper aware of which brands are converting for Jess at which time. And I'm gathering those insights and the sales data and sending it over to the brand to say, you know, Hey, it looks like we should be doing a partnership because Jess is crushing it in sales for you in an organic space already. And so let's do something sponsored and really engage her audience with like your key messages this time. So yeah, I think like for us, like we've always tried to take like a very strategic data-driven response to how we focus on our partnerships. It's certainly refreshing, um, I'll say from my perspective. And I work with a variety of both talent managers and talent and managed services. I kind of have a hodgepodge of how you do this because of the size and scope of different clients. I want to throw this out for, I guess, for Molly first, but uh, Jess, I'd love your take on it too. I oftentimes will reach out to a talent manager or talent and say, hey, you know, I've got a client that's interested in you. They like your content. Here's what they're trying to do. And I'll you know give them a brief and say, here's, here's the brief. Almost always, I, the response I get back is, what is your list of deliverables? And my response to that question is, my list of deliverables is what it takes to reach the goal. And so if it takes one YouTube video, awesome. If it takes 400 Instagram stories, then that's what it takes. I don't know the answer to that question. You do because you know your audience. My goal is typically to either create awareness or change the way someone thinks about a product or service or potentially, you know, drive people to a conversion point, et cetera. And so instead of going to you and saying, I want two Instagram stories and one YouTube video and a blog post and three tweets and da 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 what's that price? It's not a commodity to me. It's a communication strategy. And so I get a lot of pushback from talent and talent managers on, well, that's not how we do things. And I'm like, well, that's how you should do things. So Molly, how would you respond if, if, if I said to you, I'm not asking for a specific set of deliverables other than what it takes to accomplish the goal? How do you respond to that? 
oh, I think that this is like music to our ears that you approach partnerships in that way because that never happens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like that's like Jess's and I's dream for somebody to say that and for her and I to be like, great, this is what we need to do and this is what it would cost. I think that like that is the issue that like Jess and I, like we chat about this all day long and our frustrations around like these specific parameters that brands try to put around a campaign that are not necessarily lining up to, again, like their goal like Jess was saying, like trying to do, you know, a conversion play, but asking for in-feed posts, like it just doesn't make any sense for us. It's like those small nuances that drive us crazy. So I think if more brands were able to take that approach of saying, you know, we are really looking to drive whatever signups for this petition that we're running or like, you know, trying to sell tickets for this like in-person event. I would love if we had like just end goal and then the agent and talent were able to back end into that with a specific scope of work that like is tried and true to her and her audience and that we know would work for that. I mean, that's the dream. I don't think that we have nearly enough brands and agencies approaching this industry in that way. It'd be a lot easier. (laughs) It would be so much easier. That coupled with, I don't care what you talk, like you don't have to talk about this specific campaign messaging. You can use your own words. You can talk about the reasons you love this product in particular. And you don't have to say the three things that I think you should say. I mean, that would revolutionize my job. (laughs) Jess hates campaign messaging. She hates hates campaign messaging. (laughs) Yeah. So, well, and there's, there's a, I think there's also a little bit of that opens up kind of a Pandora's box of, of issues and complications too, on, on both of those topics. So if, if I am reaching out to someone and saying, uh, and I'm, I'm basically kind of trying to shoot a hole in my own theory here. But if I reach out to you and say, okay, I need you to tell me what the deliverables are. There's a danger in that because what if I have a budget, let's say I've got $100,000 and I have to, I need to use as many influencers as possible. I can reach out to two mid-tier influencers and say, you map it out for me. And they could both come back with $75,000, you know, you know, campaign ideas. And now all of a sudden I've only got two influencers and I can't really use both of them because it's out of my my price range. And so I think it does open up a Pandora's box. So I think there has to be a lot more communication and collaboration on the front end so that you understand when you're coming up with the deliverables, what you've got to work with. And brands aren't always, you know, nobody wants to say the number first, right? Nobody wants to throw out, here's my budget or here's how much it costs. It's a negotiation. So I think that also clouds it as well. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know why brands are so scared to bring budget to the table first. I feel like when I worked brand side often, like I would reach out to influencers and I would give a ballpark of, I knew what my budget was. Right. And I knew where I could flex and like my give or take a couple of thousands of dollars. So I could approach them and say, I have $5,000 for this campaign. What makes sense for you? I was never afraid to do that. I really don't know where brands and agencies got into this space where they were afraid to do that. Because if you come to me and you say, the scope can be whatever and throw us a budget, you're almost leaving it too open-ended for us. Like, again, I can put you together a $75,000 campaign or a $7,500 campaign. I don't know what your budget is. And it's sort of like a waste of my time and Jess's Mm -hmm. to sit here and brainstorm, like, here's our best case scenario, what we would love to do if we had $100,000 when your budget is closer to five. So I love the approach of coming to us to say like, hey, we have five to $10,000 for this. What can we get for it? What makes sense for us? And then we can then back end from there. I often ask brands, like I just had this the other day, like a brand was like, well, we don't really have a desired scope and we don't know what the budget is. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I, okay. Like here's a $25,000 plan and a 2,500 and a 50, like take your pick. I think it's so much easier for us as like talent managers and talent to have a budget in mind and then to back end in from there. Well, and and I'll ask, I'll say too that that's the agencies get it right back from the brands they work with too because if I've yeah. got an RFP or a new business pitch from a big brand and I say okay what what budget did you have in mind they're like well we don't really have a budget in mind why don't you tell us how much it's going to cost you know? exactly and then they come back and they're like oh that's way out of budget for us and right. I'm like well then you do have a budget in mind yeah. you just don't want to say it. Absolutely. And and it's weird because I, I actually, you know, my day job is at an agency where um, there's a perception out there among bigger brands that we're a small town agency and we're not. We actually work with national and international clients. So when they, uh, when we go to someone and say, well, here's what it costs to work with us, we get a lot of weird looks because they didn't expect that we have a higher price tag than a small town agency because that's not what we are. So yep. there's all sorts of just muddy water there. 
We've got more with Molly Tracy and Jess Keys in just a moment. This year's NBA playoffs are going to feature a lot of great rookies, and FanDuel wants you to be one of them. Make your debut on FanDuel Sportsbook with promo code ROOKIE, and your first bet is risk-free up to 1000 bucks. So you can bet the point spread, grab the money line, or build a same-game parlay. And if you make a rookie mistake, FanDuel will give you up to $1,000 back in site credit so you can take another shot. Okay, this guy's got potential. Make every moment more with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Sign up and unlock your risk-free first bet up to $1,000. We're looking forward to seeing what you're made of. 21 plus in President Virginia. First online real money wager only. Refund issued as non-withdrawable site credit that expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, uh, Jess, I want to ask you, you know, consumer trends are all always shifting. TikTok is obviously becoming more important these days. Facebook and even Instagram seem to be leveling off, if not becoming slightly less interesting for consumers. But the hidden power of influence is still in, you know, kind of what Molly talked about earlier, blogs, podcasts, email lists. Now the metaverse is becoming a thing. What are you thinking about or doing to evolve with your audience and where do you see you being influential three or four years down the road? You know, I think that every influencer will answer that question a little bit differently. And I think that I just am constantly asking myself, A, what do I actually want to be doing? Where is the space that I am spending the most time in as a consumer? Where are my girls hanging out? The answer is it's not TikTok. Like, Snapchat was not for me. TikTok was not for me. Like, I know that is not my thing and I'm okay with that. And (laughs) and my audience is okay with that too. So I think it's being choosy in that regard because you can't, you can't do it all and be effective. I think you have to pick a couple things and focus there and do them really well. That being said, my blog is first and foremost, always going to be um, a big focus of mine. I, that's kind of, I, I love writing. I'm a journalism major. That's where all my passion started. It's where it still is. But at the same time, it's really important to promote my blog on Instagram and specifically on Instagram stories and for the content to be very different, but you know, connected on those two platforms. My girls are not spending a lot of time on Facebook. So I don't post to Facebook anymore. Like it's not worth my time. I I don't post to Twitter, not worth my time. So the, that is where my two efforts are focused always. And that is what has worked well for me. And I think that is where I will continue to be. If there is a platform that comes up in the next five years that women who are busy women living in mostly city, I don't know, city communities who are working moms, like girls who are my audience, if they're moving over to that platform, I will go to that platform. But for now, that's where, that's where it's at. Ollie, are the, are the other, uh, you know, talent that you work with uh, similar in that regard, or are there any that are, you know, sort of constantly migrating and checking out the next best thing? Yes and no. I mean, I have some creators that have really dived deep into TikTok and seen some great success there. That said, like they're incredibly niche on those platforms. Like I have a gal who is very fitness focused, who has, you know, really blown up on TikTok um, and had really quick and steady growth and was actually one of those like rare cases that saw some of that growth transfer over to her Instagram as well, which is, you know, always the case with TikTok. But she also has a younger audience. You know, she herself is 27. She's really more of that like, 22 to 28 is really more like her sweet spot, which like there's a strong audience for that on TikTok. And I think TikTok is very, it's different in the sense that there's almost like, I almost see it Reddit-esque where there's like subcultures on TikTok where there's definitely, you know, there's women, there's an audience of like women over 60 on there. But I think I, you know, I have a couple of creators that are trying to to dabble there. I think for them, they find it to be incredibly fun and like an easy, fun, creative outlet for them. You know, TikTok is definitely less curated. I feel like they think there's a little bit less pressure to, it's almost like, I feel like it's almost like the good old days of Instagram where you just posted whatever you wanted to post. And like, you didn't worry about it being incredibly curated and beautiful. And it was just much more raw. And I think that, you know, most of the women that I've worked with have been doing this for about 10 years. Like they are OGs in the space. And so it's almost like them sort of like returning to like the good old days of Instagram and just being a little bit more like playful and because TikTok is so quick too, and you're not as like algorithm focused as IG, like 
you can put up like a meh piece of content and you don't care. Whereas like for Instagram, it's like, you're really punished if you don't get some strong engagement on that. I feel like for the next couple of days, you see like a downtick in your engagement numbers. So I think there's just like a little bit more of a feeling of freedom over there. And I have some gals that like, I have one that has a podcast that she's, you know, really excited about. Um, I have a gal that just launched a fitness app. And so they're dabbling in a, in a few different things. But I think like Jess said for her, like she really understands her community and where they're spending time. And so for her, she's like, I would much rather obviously dive deeper into, you know, where the women, where my community is at versus try to force them onto a platform that just, they're not really interested in. Another topic I think it's important that we dive into. Uh, we talk a lot on this show about the people behind influencer uh, marketing software platforms, or we talk to the people behind influencer marketing software platforms. There's Tagger, which is a presenting sponsor of this show. And then there's Isaiah and Maverick and Creator IQ and Aspire IQ and Tracker and so on and so on. Molly, let me start with you on this one. Are, <laughs> are the influencer marketing software platforms good? Are they bad? Are they useful to you? You are they not so? Uh, Don't ask you? the talent manager this question. <laughs> well, no, Especially I'm asking the talent manager. Podcast. I told you I was gonna pitch you off. Here we go. <laughs> um, I think the answer. I think our answers might piss more people off than maybe you posing that question. I was gonna well, say <laughs> you can blame it on me, but I, I want you to answer the question. <laughs> um, they are the absolute bane of my existence as a talent manager. They're and, and I struggle with this because I worked brand side for years, and so. As a brand, I think, you know, again, platforms like Tagger and Creator IQ and Aspire, like they are life changing for the people that are running those campaigns, especially people that are doing gifting campaigns and seeding to 500 influencers and running paid. Like we didn't really have platforms like that. Like they were just being released when I was working brand side. So like we were living in Excel sheets, right? Which is just yeah. like not, it, it's not a productive way to run a campaign. And it's really, really hard to get, you know, reporting and metrics. And like, I understand from the brand side, like it's awful to chase people down for insights. And like, it's just like, <laughs> I know that's the toughest job. So brand side, like I get it. It makes your life so much easier. The struggle that we have is from the talent side, the, the only one that I've ever worked with that I found to actually be successful is qualified. And it's a singular agency that I know that uses it. It gives me access as their talent manager to run the program for my talent. So I have almost like I can have my influencers underneath my profile there. So if I'm running different campaigns for influencers, I log in as Bray. I can approve things as that talent. I can send content through as that talent. Otherwise, like I'm trying to log in and out of creator IQ for nine different creators. And like, I have a small roster. I have no idea how these agencies are running, you know, this with 50 to 100 different people on the roster. I also just think like it never works. Like Jess and I are always like, this isn't connected right. And I don't know what's going on. And like, as somebody for me, who's like a psycho about sending insights because I worked for inside forever. Like, I don't need you to connect it to Creator IQ. I will send you the insights. I swear. Like you will get them in your inbox. I don't know. Yeah, but I don't get my fancy charts and graphs that are all together. Well, and I can just click a button. That's what I, I want. know, which is like the nice thing. <laughs> and trust me, like it, I get it on the brand side. It's so much easier, but I think it's just, I always find them to be very bulky. Also, the other thing that I really hate about it is that I could wax poetic about this all day long is that. Bray funnels all of our payments through us. So all of our contracts are signed like Bray for service of whatever talent. And so we collect payment and then we pay out our creators from there. And so I'm now having to log into like creator IQ and everybody wants to pay through that versus doing an ACH or a check, which is a whole other deal. So like now I got to change Jess's bank information to my bank information, but then I got to make sure I change it back because what if she does another campaign through there? Like, it's just a mess. There's just like no good platform I found that actually does it that serves like the talent and creator side. Well, brand side, hundred percent. I don't know how I live life without those, but. Yeah, I, I would have a hard time surviving and in, in what I do without them. Jess, any direct experience with these platforms that strike a chord for you that you want to share? Because I think that a lot of them are listening. So we're helping them get better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the big perks of having talent management is you don't have to deal with all of these companies anymore. <laughs> I they are extremely cumbersome. They are not user-friendly. They may they take all of the 
the personal interaction yeah. and the, the relationship out of influencer marketing and the relationship is what is so important, I think, between the brand and the influencer themselves. And it just seems like it's very transactional aside from how annoying all the technical issues are. Um, so yeah, I, again, from the brand side, totally makes sense. You, I, I think you have to have one of those companies on board at some point um, if you're going to do anything at scale just to keep yourself sane. But I I don't think I know any influencers who enjoy working <laughs> through those companies. I will echo the sentiment about taking out like the relationship portion because I've worked on some campaigns where it's like, you know, we chat over email, we secure the deal. And then it's like, okay, now just like here's Creator IQ and submit all your content there and we'll approve it all there. And then we'll gather your insights and pay you from there. And like, it doesn't allow for like that relational aspect of the back and forth of like sending the content and like sharing commentary about what you felt and how the brand liked it. And it's just like, it's really hard for us to, I think, build a relationship there with the agency or brand that's using that because so much of it is just moved over to that platform afterwards. And like, I don't know, you miss those like, Hey, how was your weekend? And like, hope you're having a great Tuesdays. And I don't know. Isn't this weather crappy? I don't know. Like you, just right. like miss, you miss all of that like personal aspect. Well, and I would echo that too, because, um, you know, Molly, uh, our mutual friend, jo- uh, Johanna Voss introduced us and I have become, you know, really friendly with her and literally will send her an email or pick up the phone and call her and just say, Hey, I'm thinking about this about for my podcast about influencer marketing. What's your perspective on this? And like, we have a really good back and forth and she gets to pick my brain about the agency and brand side of things. And I get to pick her brain about the talent and talent management side of things. And so that doesn't happen if you're just, you know, sort of transactionalizing everything through a platform. So there's got to be some give and take there, I think. Um, So I I don't mean to continue to, you know, pour salt in the wounds here for anybody, (laughs) but I'm wondering if there's a difference between the software companies that sort of transactionalize everything and dealing with the managed services like the Isaiah's of the world, where I imagine on their end of things, they have a person that reaches out to the talent or the talent manager and says, Hey, we're doing this with this brand. And it's, I think it's a little bit more hands-on service, but I don't know from your all's perspective, have you dealt with a talent, a managed services company? And is the interaction different? I have actually worked with, I, I, I used to work with Isaiah a lot. And yes, to your point, they did have specific account managers that I had relationships with. And I loved them. I loved working with them. I will say I started turning down Isaiah partnerships because their process was so annoying. And it was like, I'm like, you people have to like, you're going to have to start paying me a thousand more dollars to deal with your, your platform because it's, it's awful. Um, and it, it was just very cumbersome and strange. And you know what? They could have made so many updates since, and I haven't worked with them for probably five years, <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was my experience. And I, I often will turn down partnerships that require a lot of that just because I'm like, this isn't worth it for me. This is too much. Well, and just so the listeners out there who maybe don't understand kind of what she's specifically referring to. So on, on a managed services perspective, from my perspective as an agency that would hire them or from a brand that would hire them, I say, here's the brief. Here's what we want to do. Go find the creators that fit this. Let us review a list. So they come back with a nice list of all the stuff, just like they're using Tagger or one of these tools for us, basically. Uh, they come back with a list and the brand and I go through it and we pick the ones that we want to you know, kind of engage for this and we give them a budget and a brief and they go out and they do all the legwork to get everybody on board. But what that means um, on Jess's end or on Molly's end that in order to execute all of the stuff, they have to, they are forced to, Molly and Jess are forced to log into their platform on the back end and upload, here's a draft of all the content that I'm proposing for this. And then that comes into a, a queue that comes to me or the brand to say, we approve this, or here's the feedback on that. And so there, it is a logistical kind of nightmare to make these things work. And it gets worse the more creators you have on a campaign because now you're juggling 15, 20, 30, 50 people. And uh, it's 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 not easy for anybody to manage on your all's end of things on the talent and talent management side. It's not easy for the managed services to manage either. And it's certainly not easy really on the agency side of things. I don't know what the solution is to make that an easier process. And if one company figures it out, then it still doesn't solve the problem because there's so many other companies that do it. And nobody's going to use one unified system. So it's just yeah. a big cluster. 
Yeah, it is. <laughs> I tend to agree. Just let me send you a Dropbox full of content. I'll put the caption right in the body of the email for you. I'll do the text overlays for the yeah. stories and the email for you. <laughs> like, I just think it's so much easier. But like I said, I get it on the brand side of things. It's a lot to manage with your working with like a large scale campaign. Maybe Ted Murphy et al. will uh, be listening and and take this uh, <laughs> this conversation to their product development teams and figure something out. Who knows? I don't know. Fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, I hope none of them are pissed at me now, but they probably will be. It's okay. <laughs> I've talked to them before. They they enjoy feedback, good or, or bad, because it makes them better. So we'll be all right. So Molly and or Jess, probably more specific to Jess here, do you worry at all that the explosion of people calling themselves influencers or aspiring to be influencers, the 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 signal to noise ratio out there in the content creator space, do you worry at all that that will water the market down so much that you can't charge as much or you have to keep doing something amazing to one up yourself and stay out in front of folks? Or do, do you worry this is going to keep getting harder as time goes on? Personally, I don't um, just because my audience is never going to go away and the problems and the issues that I address with my content are never going to go away. And I, yeah, I feel like a lot of people say, well, are you going to be doing this when you're 50? And I'm like, okay, well, the girls who are reading my blog right now, they're going to be 50 when I'm 50. <laughs> so why wouldn't I be? Um, yeah, I, I do think that it's only getting, um, obviously, influencer marketing is growing like crazy. It's becoming a much bigger focus for all brands, which I'm sure you would agree with, at least in, in my perspective. It's, it's always going to be evolving. It's always going to be changing. Um, but I also think that while there are so many people in this space, it's getting more saturated. There still aren't that many people who are doing it really well and actually converting. And they're doing it strategically in a way that is serving both their brand partners, but most importantly, their audience. So to me, that is, I am not seeing that many people who can do that. And I'm not seeing an influx of people who are just going to start blogs tomorrow or influencing tomorrow and be serving my my girls better than I can serve my girls, I guess. I love the fact that you keep calling them my girls. That's, that's are, cool. They are my girls. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. That's good stuff. All right, Molly, any last thoughts about working with, uh, you know, assholes like me at agencies and whatnot and, or, or brands uh, that will make us uh, better for you and for the talent? Let's see. Jess, should we have, um, I feel like we should have wrote a list or brought a list with us of all of our grievances <laughs> that we have. Molly, we could start, uh, we could start like a course could, on that. We really could. Jess and I could write a course. I mean, we've been doing it long enough where there's like just small nuances and annoyances of campaigns. Like for instance, Jess's biggest thing, which is now like baked into all of our contracts is most of our campaigns that we work on send you a URL or UTM that is sent to like a homepage of a website. And this is especially annoying to Jess and her community because Jess's community, and she can expand upon this, they want to shop exactly what she's talking about, whether that's like clothing or the beauty product or whatever. They want to shop the exact item that she is trying on. So sending Jess's audience to a homepage of a website and asking them to go on a scavenger hunt to find an item that she is wearing is a huge hurdle to conversion and trying to get that across to brands of an understanding. Like I've literally said to them, like, this is going to hurt your conversion. And I know that conversion is your focus. So just let us do it our way and we will perform for you. Do not stand in our way. Like let Jets do this, how she knows it worked for her audience and her community. It's things like that, that I feel like brands and agencies are sort of short-sighted in the way that other creators work and how creators like to position things to their community. And they take a very blanket approach to this market and their campaigns. Whereas if you, you know, communicated with, with influencers and creators on how they want to bring this to life could be so much more successful. It's small nuances like that, that I think like drive yeah. Jess and I crazy that we're always like, we're constantly texting like, why are we doing this? Like, why are we, like, why are they giving us pushback on this? Right. Like I can, I can sell double the products that you want me to like to sell. If you would just let us do it our, like if you would just make me a landing page with the five things that I am <laughs> promoting on this landing page, if you insist on having one and only one URL. Yeah. It's, I, I think especially as brands are starting to scale with influencer marketing a lot. It's a lot of check the box and there aren't a lot of checks and balances in terms of, does this make sense for ROI? It, like, are we setting ourselves up for the best conversion that we possibly can? Or are we sending people to a homepage that 
probably isn't properly optimized anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think, um, but Jason, I know that you don't do that with your oh. clients. Um, I don't so. actually, I'm a major <laughs> proponent of custom URLs and UTM parameters and short URLs that people can remember. Like I'm, I've got right. this, like I, I get, I probably make people on both sides angry because I'm anal about it. I'm like, no, 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 we cannot send people to home pages. But that's your, that's, that, that's why you're good at your job. That's what you're supposed to do. So yeah. No, we appreciate working with, with friends. We, we, like we really do. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Well, this, ladies, this has been really awesome. Let me start with Molly. If there's talent out there or brands uh, that want to get a hold of you and find you on the interwebs, where do they go? You can find me at raydigital.com, B R A I, or at raydigital on IG. Very good. And Jess, where can people find your girls? JessKeys.com is my blog or follow me at JessKeys underscore because I still can't get the JessKeys about the <laughs> underscore to give me her handle on Instagram. <laughs> you know, I, I, there's a politician in North Carolina named Jason Falls and he he reached out to me one time and offered me like $100 for the URL. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Hell no. And by the way, he won't send me a yard sign. So screw that guy. <laughs> the least he could do. You know, for those of you who are talent, I'm betting you got some good nuggets there. For those of you who are or aspire to be talent managers, probably the same, right? And if you're at one of the influencer marketing software companies, I think the criticisms here are useful if you want them to be. Maybe there's some headway we can all make together and get better as a result of the conversation. Good chat. Thanks to Molly and Jess for taking the time and being so transparent with us on the show today. Folks, don't forget to drop us a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You should pause and do it now so you don't forget. Also, if you'd like to take a deep dive on influencer marketing topics every so often, subscribe to my companion newsletter at jason.online slash subscribe. I send it every four to six weeks. I go deep on a topic to make your influence marketing smarter. Every four to six weeks are basically when I have something to say. I don't pepper your inbox, but I make sure that you have some good things to read from time to time. Want to help make a future episode of Influence awesome? Ask your question about influence or influence marketing that you may want my answer to or take on. Record a voice memo and send it via email or just send a regular email to jason at jasonfalls.com. But if you do the voice memo and send it, I can use your question in your voice on the show, which would be great. I may use that comment, whether it's voice or just something you wrote in an email. I may use that comment on a future episode or your question to inspire a show topic. If I do, I'll send you a signed copy of Winfluence the book as a thank you. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is an audio companion to my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my periodic newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. This podcast comes to you from the Marketing Podcast Network. I'm Shell Holtz, co-host of For Immediate Release, also on NPN. I'm Neville Hobson, co-host of FIR, where since 2005, Shell and I have been exploring changing technologies, behaviors, and organizations, and what this means for you. Our monthly show takes a deep dive into these issues, and shorter episodes focus on hot topics and emerging trends. Visit marketingpodcasts.net or search for FIR Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.